Welcome back to the marketplace. Ghana could soon be removed from the list of countries with serious lapses when it comes to money laundering and terrorism financing. This is because the Financial Intelligence Center is currently implementing measures that would force the EU to review its recent warning about the country and decision to scrutinize financial transactions from Ghana. There's more in the following report. According to the Financial Intelligence Center, it is already working with the globally recognized body that supervises the fight against money laundering to protect the country against these practices. According to sources close to the center, it is currently implementing an action plan which would see Ghana classified as a fully compliant country when it comes to having the right systems against money laundering and terrorism financing. Joy Business understands that at the recent review meeting in France, Ghana was given high praise over how it has implemented its action plan. This should mean that before December this year, Ghana may be recognized as an anti-money laundering compliant country. We are learning that the Financial Intelligence Center is currently working with all the relevant government agencies in the country to deal with all these challenges when it comes to money laundering and terrorism financing. The European Union recently in a statement announced that it will blacklist Ghana by October this year if the country does not take measures to address challenges regarding deficiencies giving way to money laundering. The finance ministry, on the other hand, has described the action by the European Union as unfortunate. This is because steps are being taken to deal with all these problems identified. Information being gathered indicates that the country has filed an official protest at the European Union headquarters in Brussels. The warning from the European Union could mean that there would be serious security scrutiny any time a bank or business from Ghana wants to carry out any transaction with their counterparts in the European Union. Eric Kukumensa is a security intelligence analyst with eCrime Bureau. He joins me for a discussion on this. Um, Eric, thanks for your time this afternoon. So help us understand, for those wondering, what does it mean that we are on the EU's blacklist for money laundering breaches? What does it imply? Yeah, um, good afternoon to your uh, viewers. Uh, as rightly mentioned in your video, uh, EU recently uh, issued a statement saying that Ghana is going to be blacklisted. That means that all transactions that will go to Euro will be scrutinized uh, very well before uh, it goes through. And being blacklisted means that they suspect that criminals are using Ghana as a, um, a route mm. to channel fraudulent funds and then uh, funds that are not got through legitimate means. Uh, we know that uh, government has contested this and we are being told that they are making moves to get uh, the EU to remove our list from uh, our, our, the country from the blacklist. I just want to um, get from you, is it fair judgment by the EU to put Ghana on that list, judging from what you have been monitoring over the years? Uh, from what we've been monitoring over the years, uh, the fact is that usually before they blacklist you, uh, they identify some deficiency areas. And based on that deficiency area, they, they rate you and then they uh, put you on the blacklist. Now, what I understand is that uh, Ghana, the authorities, the FIC, the Bank of Ghana, uh, are saying that Ghana was not duly consulted mm. before that list came out. So that is what is being contested because usually when these vulnerability areas are identified, when these deficiency areas are identified, uh, you, you would have to give the country the opportunity to, uh, to speak for itself and then tell you what they put in place in order to uh, mitigate money laundering in the country. Um, and based on that argument, what are the chances do you think that we would get the EU to sort of remove our, our, our country from that list? Uh, for, for, for we going up the list, it will take a lot of effort from the leadership for them to be able to uh, provide proof that those deficiency areas, we have done enough, we have passed enough laws, we have passed enough regulations to be able to, uh, um, you know, mitigate money laundering. Mm. Yeah. So, so I think that when they push further and get more information, to back their points, 
they would be able to get their names of the list. Uh, do, you, do you agree that the country, and the final one, do you agree that the country has over the years done enough to fight money laundering? Where are the lapses? Uh, for money laundering, it's, it's a very complex situation. Uh, in fact, from the regulatory point of view, from the uh, those on the grounds, even like the financial institutions, certainly when transactions are being conducted, it goes through the financial institutions. And it will take a lot more effort for the financial institutions to do their KYCs and then the CDDs on all transactions before the transactions go through. So I, I think that uh, way forward, the Bank of Ghana, the FIC would have to uh, strictly enforce uh, the regulations so that the financial institutions report all suspicious transactions to them. Thank you so much for your thoughts uh, this afternoon. You heard Eric Kwekumeza, who is a security intelligence analyst with the uh, Ecrime Bureau. Thanks very much. Now to the 28th MTN Business World Executive Breakfast Meeting, where business leaders have been discussing the future of work amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, CEO of Fidelity Bank Ghana, Julian Opuni, has been giving indications that things will certainly not return to normal after the pandemic in the work environment. According to him, uh, work output instead of the hours one puts in would be key. COVID-19 has actually expedited that process and if you look at the most recent happenings, especially in our part of the world and the, the, the lockdown situation where you still have to have a clear business continuity plan in place which enables you to carry on offering you know, services to your customers and also safeguarding your staff, measuring productivity, etc. That meant that you had just a few days to react to all the stuff that you had um, written down which you were not hoping to necessarily put into place without something like this happening. It's also important to bear in mind that this expedited process has meant that we can now leverage on new opportunities and that we have changed behavior going forward. Without a doubt, once this passes, things will not be the same. And I think any business will be fairly naive to think that they can just go back to the old way of working. Um, if, if you look at, in our environment, if you like, um, the remote way of working is now effectively here to stay. And certain capabilities that we didn't think were available suddenly have become very evident. Um, you know, meetings happening not necessarily with eight, ten people in a room, but the, the ability to just do lots of meetings in a very short space of time has now become um, the way of work. And we've had to create that capability. And even the protocols around working uh, remotely and having meetings and teleconference uh, with your colleagues. One of the things also is about role reassignment because with the level of traffic and activity at Tetra, we now have to quickly scale up certain parts of the business that may not be seen as evidently critical to the delivery of our services. Um, and you still have to do it in an e-learning kind of environment and train and get people ready to be able to do those services because the customer needs have been you know, changed significantly as a result of what's going on. It also means that we've had to establish, and all business will have to do, establish new ways of measuring productivity and activity of your staff. Because when you have people scattered over various um, locations and all over the place, how do you, do you still use your traditional ways of measuring output? And I think what is evident now is because of the rotation system and the fact that people are working from home, etc., it's no longer about hours worked. It's really around output and you have to put in place those systems that enable um, businesses measure output and see the productivity you know, of their staff. Ms. Opini asked that cybersecurity must be one of the topmost concerns since most workers are increasingly using the internet to get the job done. Cyber, especially in our environment, has now become a real issue, cybersecurity. As you migrate a lot of activity um, and transactions on digital platforms, both for internal working and also for serving your customers, it now becomes high priority. So every organization will have to now reprioritize all their initial projects, even from us you know, recently as January, because now there's a reprioritization, which means that you don't have to react to the realities of your market. 
And so cyber and all the budgeting around cyber, that normally is over a prolonged period because it's a fluid, ongoing system. It's no longer the case because you have to create that readiness and the ability to ensure that you protect your business in the short term. Um, maximizing space usage. So suddenly with the rotation, it's become very evident that if you look in your work environment, you probably don't need as much space as you have. Yeah. Hot desking, which used to be the, a buzzword maybe years and years ago, now becomes very evident. And a lot of, if you like, head office functions. And I always separate it from the frontline businesses in, in the likes of a financial institution and the back office processes, where in the current environment, they have to go into that mode of working where there's a the hot desking. That means you don't need as much space. There's efficiency creation as a result of that. But on the front end as well, you need, now have to create the space for social distancing in your frontline delivery of services. You have to have discussions around the forced migration of activity onto digital platforms, which is something that we've been talking about over a period of time. But now the psyche of our customers is they don't want to find themselves in an environment where they are unnecessarily exposed to potential infection. They don't want to be in a situation situation where they have to go out of their current comfort zones. And so you have to create the readiness for the digital platforms. It means that things like channel optimization, and for a banking institution, channels are anywhere in which we can interface with our customers. So you're talking about bricks and mortar, branches, um, ATMs, and then there's the digital alternative channels, which are your app. USSD, USSD internet banking, all of those sorts of things. And that means that they have to be on a high state of readiness and availability for your customers. And there'll be a forced migration in certain instances to protect both your business and them. So I think in a nutshell, that's the reality of the current environment we're in. Well, the CEO of Fidelity Bank, uh, Julian Opuni, discussing the future of work after the COVID-19 pandemic. Obviously, things are not going to be the same. Now, let's move on. Africa is poised to go ahead with the Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, but the COVID-19 pandemic is going to change how we trade amongst ourselves, at least for a period, and that is when e-commerce becomes a vital. Now, Cats International has been studying this, exploring how African countries can leverage e-commerce in its uh, free trade agenda. Um, we're hoping to get the West Africa Regional Director for Cats, that international, uh, Apia Kusia Dumako, to tell us more about this study. But uh, while we work that out, we are joined by Executive Director of the Africa Center for International Trade and uh, Development, that is Isaac Hubert Arthur. It's, it's great to have you on the program this afternoon. Um, we are hoping that we can get some more insight into um, CATS international study, but I, I guess that you've been looking into this as well. What opportunities uh, do e-commerce or does e-commerce present for free trade here in Africa? Hello, Isaac, can you hear me? All right. I'm not too sure if Isaac can hear me. We'll try and rectify that and go back to him. But you're watching the marketplace. Uh, we want to discuss how we can leverage e-commerce uh, in order to benefit from the Continental Free Trade Agreement. Uh, can we do the story with uh, Isaac uh, Ishmael Yamsin, maybe, while we wait for that? Now, uh, he has been talking about uh, Internet of Things, information technology, and how that can also help us access global markets. We can listen to bits of what he said at a forum. Our business can be better if supported, especially women. Total entrepreneurial activity rate, a measure of new entrepreneurs, suggests that African women entrepreneurs are surging. A 2019 report suggests that global average of women, the stability and the deepening of Africa's nascent democracy depends upon what we do with our youth. If you see Mohamed Yahya of the UNDP Africa, he has written something called Africa's Defining Challenge. The youth that we need to use, but we don't create the freedoms around for the youth, they will migrate somewhere else. Africa is the most youthful continent. A trained and technology-savvy, ICT-savvy youth 
equipped with nation building skills can be a force for development. But if we don't, the private sector doesn't create the jobs for them, they become a factor for destabilization for our continent. Why private sector needs democracy? We need the infrastructure in terms of ports, internet connectivity, multi dictatorship like to close down access to the internet. So we need democracy to be able to provide the broadband adequate width and competitively priced for our tech savvy youth to get involved. To facilitate our access to markets in an increasingly technology-driven world. We need well-trained professionals. But if freedoms essential for innovation are stifled, these footloose ICT savvy global citizens who are called net, net citizens will depart to enrich other destinations as evidenced by the millions of African science, technology, engineering, and innovation professionals who are applying their skills in the diaspora. So that was uh, economist Kwame Pienim speaking at the Ishmo Yamsin and Associates Business Roundtable webinar. He asked that the number of women in business in Africa is disproportionate compared with developed countries. He indicated that conscious effort must be made to invest in women like is done in developed countries. Our business can be better if supported, especially women. Total entrepreneurial activity rate, a measure of new entrepreneurs, suggests that African women entrepreneurs are surging. A 2019 report suggests that global average of women entrepreneurs was 10.2% as compared with 15.1% for low-income countries and 21.8% for sub-Saharan Africa. It's interesting because the MasterCard index of women entrepreneurs in 2019 report shed some light on this surge of African women entrepreneurs. Those advanced countries that provide open markets and support for small medium enterprises provide, and I quote, opportunity-driven entrepreneurial activity for women. But in low-income countries, the search is, and I quote, necessity-driven. All right, so let's go to our previous discussion on the African Continental Free Trade Agreement and how we can uh, leverage e-commerce. Hopefully, we can speak with uh, West Africa Regional Director of CAST International, that is uh, Kusi Apel Kusi Adumako, on the study they conducted and what the outcome was. Uh, great to have you on the program. We are hoping to be joined by Isaac Hubert Arthur, who is also um, the Executive Director of the Africa Center for International Trade and Development. I see both of you. Um, Isaac, I'm not too sure. Can you hear me now? Okay, but let's begin with uh, Mr. Uh, Pierre Kusia Dumako. Tell us more about what you discovered in your study to be the opportunities that uh, e-commerce presents for free trade here in Africa. Okay, thank you very much, Dara. So the study looks at how can we use e-commerce as a tool to drive the AFCFTA and to create opportunity for Africans. So we look at a couple of countries we use existing data and some key person interviews. And we found out that some countries are doing well when it comes to the, uh, when it comes to the e commerce, mm. because those countries have been able to put in the enabling uh, framework. That is the, the legislation. They have the ecosystem to support uh, e commerce, like the payment systems. They also have uh, what we call the addressing system and other security measures that all uh, add up as an enabling instrument for e-commerce. But some countries like Sudan and uh, Benin and Togo and others, 
uh, you realize that they have they have not been able to put enough measures to uh, take advantage of their e-commerce. Uh, let's continue from there. They are not having enough measures. So you know, when it comes to internet connectivity in Africa, it's a big challenge. And so when we talk about e-commerce, we have a long way to go, especially when we want to take off with the uh, continental free trade on the 1st of July. I mean, trading begins the next year, really. So how do we uh, overcome these challenges? So I think before the AFCFTA came into full motion, the UNCTAD uh, asked some researchers to come and do ass readiness assessment and readiness study for some selected countries to know mm. how they are ready for the e-commerce. And when the diagnostic report came, the diagnostic report also came up with measures that those countries need to do to be able to become fully ready for the e-commerce uh, uh, evolution. And I'm happy to say that countries have done well about two years ago, we were in Nairobi for the first uh, AU e-commerce week, which saw African trade ministers and uh, commerce ministers and communication ministers pledging their full commitment in ensuring what the e-commerce can do to transform the economy. You know that this when this pandemic mm. came, one thing that they most economists is that the presence of the e-commerce in the U.S., for example, Amazon right. is making over a million dollars of sales, uh, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars of sales on a daily basis from the e-commerce. Let, let so me know, e not to cut you. Uh, opportunity to help most countries mm. uh, to be able to catch up, and the value for e-commerce has gone past trillions of dollars. Mm. And so the AU, AU as a body, is very very key on e-commerce. Let me also add that. The third phase of the negotiation for the AFCFT is going to look at e-commerce. And so if you are an African country and you are not trying to put up the enabling framework for e-commerce, then it means you will be losing out on a lot of things. And if you can answer can this, if you can answer this next you. question in a minute for me, uh, sorry about that. Sorry to have to cut you. Uh, now, there are risks, right? Because before this, we're talking about cybersecurity risks when it comes to e-commerce as well. What are some of the risks you identified? So most of most of the merchants who are on the e-platform, they have not been able to put up a very strong uh, measures to protect subscribe I mean users data. Because when I come onto your e-platform to pay something, my credit card or my debit card, and if you don't have the enabling security framework, what it means is that hackers can easily go there and extract my personal details and use it to do shop, uh, shopping somewhere. And for this reason, some people are very, very skeptical when it comes to right. using their credit card information online. Mm. Okay. Uh, Apia Kusiad Marco, sorry we have to end it here. You have been watching The Marketplace. My name is Daryl Kwa. We'll have that conversation subsequently because it's an important conversation to have. My name is Daryl Kwa. Thanks for watching more news on our website myjoyonline.com forward slash business.